Okay, then my name is Dr. Matt Barlow. I'm one of the senior lecturers in exercise physiology here in Carnegie. And this is Helen Gravesuck. Um, and early on, actually it was not last year, it was the year before now, wasn't it? Um, I was involved with the English Surfing Federation, or it's now become the, uh, the Surfing Federation of England, and the UK Professional Surfing Association. Um, and we were doing a number of studies, um, primarily looking at female surfers. And we had an opportunity to look at TMG uh, in terms of the TMG, TMG characteristics of professional female surfers. Um, we talked about this system being a, a portable system that you can use in many different environments. Um, so this is actually uh, the place where we did our testing um, in this little gazebo on the beach, uh, surrounded by sand, uh, which Karen was very concerned about. Uh, and we were running the system off a, a petrol generator and it coped it quite well. Um, this was, uh, the event took place in May, I think. Uh, yeah, it was the May bank holiday. Uh, and actually Helen's just told me she, she's actually lightened this image to make it look like the weather was slightly better than what it was whilst we were there. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the, soft, the, the equipment worked uh, very well uh, on the beach. So I'm going to provide some kind of uh, context if you like in terms of surfing. Uh, and then Helen is going to talk more about the, the actual TMG measurements themselves. So for those of you who are not familiar with surfing, you may have seen it on TV. Uh, you may have watched Baywatch or something similar. Uh, but if you Google, uh, if you go to Google Scholar or even PubMed and you search surfing physiology, you'd actually get more hits about how you find uh, physiology-based uh, documents than what you will about actual surfing, okay, Maybe about surfing the internet rather than surfing itself. There's only a limited number of publications out there. But basically what surfing involves, if you're not familiar with it, is the surfer paddling, paddling out on a surfboard in the prone position, lying down, basically doing a front crawl stroke with their head up. Once they get into the, uh, the takeoff zone or the area where the waves are uh, starting to, to build and get to a point where they can break, uh, the surfers will wait there until an appropriate wave approaches. And there's a little bit of uh, sportsmanship in terms of determining which is the most appropriate wave to take off and surf if you're surfing against a competitor uh, and identifying whether or not that is a good wave for you to take. But when it does, the surfer will take off on the wave doing some powerful arm strokes, so basically sprint front crawl Okay, and then they perform a pop-up manoeuvre where they jump to the feet and they surf then down the wave using uh, their lower body to control the surfboard. Invariably what happens at the end of that process is the surfer falls off, the wave crashes upon them, or they pull off in a controlled manner on the back of the wave and then they paddle back out again. So that's basically the process of surfing. Okay? Uh, Loudon gave this description in 1983 and things haven't really changed very much, although we do now have jet powered surfboards and jet ski assist in some of the surfing competitions, which has changed things ever so slightly. When we look at surfing, there's various different components that can affect your performance in surfing. Um, so Mendes, Villeneuve and Bishop uh, wrote this paper in 2005, looking at all of the different components that might affect performance. So we have psychological skills in there in terms of outwitting your competitors, making the right decisions in terms of waves, cognitive mental decisions, um, you know, judging the time left in the heat, do you want to exert some strategic pressure over somebody else, um, tactical decisions, biomechanical decisions and physiological decisions. One of the things that's unique, or not necessarily unique about surfing, but needs to be, um, we need to be aware of, is that the upper, upper body and lower body do slightly different things than what they do in other sports. Generally, we expect the lower body to do most of the aerobic work. So if you think about hockey, for example, the legs are providing the, the ambulation, the movement, you're running around and you're working aerobically with your legs. Now in surfing, all of the aerobic work is actually done with the upper body in terms of the paddling, and the strength work and the power work is done through the legs. So there's a slight different switch there in terms of what we expect of the muscles during this activity. When the surfers are actually in the water, um, I guess surfing is the wrong terminology for the sport. We shouldn't call it surfing, we should call it sitting in the sea and waiting. Okay, because actually that's what surfers tend to spend a lot of their time actually doing. Um, with a similar, it was a similar group of participants on a different study. Uh, we actually did some performance analysis and we looked at what the surfers actually did. And they spent about 60% of their time sitting in the sea waiting for a wave. 
30% uh, of their time actually paddling around, hunting for waves or paddling back out to the lineup. And only about 6% of the time actually standing up on the surfboard and riding waves. And that's actually very similar to uh, what we see in male surfers, although male surfers do tend to spend slightly longer paddling and less time waiting than uh, female surfers. Um, in terms of the activity itself, I suppose we could describe it as a, a moderate to high intensity intermittent exercise. The average heart rate for, uh, for surfers is about 65% of their laboratory predicted maximum heart rate. So they're working relatively hard interspersed with session, um, portions of time where they're having a complete rest and also portions of time when they're working very hard in terms of sprinting. There'll also be some enforced breath hold, um, breath hold opportunities. So when a large wave comes and the surfer gets caught out, uh, they may get held down underwater for up to like 30 seconds normally. Um, and that would then affect their heart rate and other things that are happening. So as a result of the, uh, the nature of the exercise, how hard they're working, it's already been identified that um, VO2 peak, okay, so your aerobic power is important for surfing performance, and also your power output at the onset of blood lactate accumulation. They've been identified as, what, as, as predictors of ranking um, across different levels of surfing performance. In terms of what the female surfers look like, um, I was thinking of putting some photographs up, but I figured that's probably not appropriate. So what we've got here is the anthropometric characteristics of female surfers. Um, and what we can see is generally within uh, surfing populations, male and female, then uh, your mesomorphic score or your muscularity is going to predict your level of ability. So we see that uh, generally the more, more muscular surfers are the ones who are higher ranked. Okay, and conversely, if you have higher levels of body fat, then again, you're going to be, have a poor, poorer ranking in comparison to other surfers in general. Um, obviously, we do have some people who are less muscular and still perform well, and we still have some surfers who are um, you know, carrying a lot of adipose tissue, but still perform re reasonably well as well. Um, <clears throat> but all of these things just gives an idea really of what a surfer looks like. So we know they need to have reasonable levels of aerobic fitness. We need, know that they need, need to have good body composition in terms of appropriate levels of body fat. In terms of the male body fat percentages, well, they tend to be uh, about 10 to 12%, which is slightly higher than other elite athletes. Um, and again, the female surfers that we can see here, their body fat percentage actually, um, you know, is a slightly low for females at 18.9%. But, okay, not super lean, uh, but also not carrying too much adipose tissue in there. So what we want to do um, as part of this study really was try and get some information about what type of muscles the surfers have, given the nature of the activity. Okay. And that takes yeah. us on to TMG. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so, um Based on the developing literature and research that underpins the physiology of surf performance, there's even fewer research articles out there on the biomechanics and the neuromuscular um, contributors of performance for surfing well. Um, one particular paper by Bruce et al. 2013 actually looked at vertical leg stiffness in addition to proprioception of different level surf performers and male and female athletes. Okay? Um, the vertical leg stiffness actually was a um, differentiating variable between the good and the poorer surface in both males and females, whereas the proprioception measures didn't differentiate the good from the poor surfing population. Okay. What these two variables do have in common is that they are based on a system of muscles. So we've got vertical leg stiffness is made up of many muscles and isn't looking at this data from an individual muscle by muscle basis. Likewise with proprioception, the measures that these authors used here were from a whole body methodology. So again, it's not particularly well detailed. There is very little neuromuscular data, even from an EMG perspective, and not very much out there on lateral symmetry either. So the primary aim of this preliminary study then was to gather some normative data on the neuromuscular properties and the muscle quality of these unique athletes um, to help inform training modalities and recovery strategies as well. So the methods for this project, um, as Matt said at the start, we did all data collection on the beach and we had 15 competitive male uh, female surfers uh, volunteer for our study. We tested a range of different muscle sites, and you can see those listed here, and these have come from the upper and lower body. 
The sites were justified based on previous research from similar sports and by conducting a kinesiological analysis on the activity, thinking about the different phases of the surf performance, think about which muscles might be the prime movers and mo most interested to look at further. The sensor was uh, placed perpendicular to the muscle axis um, at the muscle belly. This was identified using Seninam guidelines um, and palpation at each of the sites. All of the anterior muscle sites were assessed by the participant lying on their back in knee flex using the support. All posterior muscle sites were assessed by the participant laying prone with knee in full extension. Upper body measurements were measured by the athlete sat in a seated position. We used the 2.5 centimetre self adhesive electrodes and these were positioned 5 centimetres away from the sensor. Um, we used a standard protocol where one millisecond electrical impulse was delivered to each site starting at 30 milliamps and this was increased by 10 until we had the maximal radial displacement from the muscle. Maximal uh, displacement from the muscle was identified by using the software um, on the screen and the stimulation resulting in the greatest radial displacement was the one that we used for our analysis. We ensured that there was a 10 second uh, rest period in between stimulations just to make sure we wouldn't get any effects from potential fatigue or um, post-activation potentiation. All analysis um, was conducted in SPSS. Um, here we got a group mean data and standard deviation and conducted pair two tests as well. So in terms of our results, again, this is just a preliminary study. Um, we looked at two key variables. We looked at the amplitude of the muscles, so the maximal displacement, or, and also the time delay. Um, we can see here we've got the range of muscles uh, that we've tested. The blue bars denote the right-hand side of the body, and the left, the, um, the yellow is the left, sorry. Okay. We know from uh, previous talks today that a lower value for this displacement predicts a stiffer muscle, okay, and a greater value there is a more pliable muscle, and for a lower value on the time delay denotes a quicker muscle, so faster responsing, responding, um, and gives some indication of muscle fibre composition underlying there. From all of the muscle sites that we tested, um, we didn't find any statistically significant differences in either of the variables between the right and the left hand side of the body. And this might indicate that our group of female surfers um, did have good levels of um, lateral symmetry there. So um, we didn't have a control group to compare our data against, and we didn't have any reference data either to make meaningful interpretations from our data. Uh, so we've relied on previously peer-reviewed information um, to try and make some sense of some of the things that we found. In terms of the TMG literature out there, there's not very much on the female population um, and there isn't very much looking at multiple muscle sites in one study. So there's lots of studies that are focused on the lower body and there are a couple that are focused on the upper body, but there are far and few between where they've looked at the whole body um, as a whole. So uh, looking at the paper on the left-hand side of the screen there, I uh, looked at top-level female kayaker performance uh, athletes. Okay. In the study, they also compared the left and the right-hand side of the body, looking at the upper body sites, for the deltoid, trapezius, and the systems dorsi. This paper did not find any statistically significant differences at these sites either for displacement. Out of the three sites tested by this paper, um, only one uh, was in common with our study, and that was the deltoid. And looking at the time delay, um, they also didn't find any statistically significant differences there either. Okay? This might indicate that there's a similar fibre type distribution between these two sports. Um, and by using the paper from Rare Town 2012, this could potentially mean that both uh, cohorts of athletes have predominantly type 2 fibres at this site. Another reason why we've got similar results here to the kayaking pe paper might potentially be the similarities in the movement and the role of the shoulder joint for both of, the, both of these sports. Um, Matt identified at the start that 30% of the time spent in surfing is actually spent paddling, which has a similar cy cyclical motion to kayaking paddling as well. In terms of the lower body then, uh, looking at this paper based on beach volleyball players, um, this study actually only looked at muscles from the hamstring and quadriceps groups. And again, here, looking at the left and the right-hand side in the female data, there were no statistically significant differences there for peak displacement um, and also time delay. 
One of the things that we've questioned since doing this analysis is whether or not it was appropriate to compare the left and the right hand side of the body as contralateral limb was selected as the independent variable and this has been used in previous work elsewhere some of which I've just presented um, and usually hasn't found any statistically significant differences. What might have been more interesting or might have been more meaningful would have been to have done a comparison between the dominant and the non-dominant sides of the body. Um, this is due to reported strength is increased on the dominant side. Okay. Um, it could also be interesting from a surf perspective to maybe do a comparison on um, stance position, so whether the surfer is a regular stance or a goofy stance, um, and that might have been a little bit more interesting there. All of the studies that have looked at um, differences between the dominant and non-dominant sides do tend to not also find statistically significant differences, um, and what this study does do actually is kind of recommends that it's okay to pull this data together in terms of looking at the right and the left leg and there's one paper that has actually done that in football I believe. So the key take home messages again from this preliminary study looking at elite female surfers are that based on the time thresholds the majority of the muscle sites were fast twitch fibers so type 2 and overall our athletes that we tested had good lateral symmetry because we didn't find any statistically significant differences between the right and the left hand sides of the body. Overall this information informs um, surf performance in terms of writing training programs and creating recovery strategies for these athletes and adds to the limited body literature that's already there. And a more general kind of obs observation or conclusion from the study is that the TMG system lives up to its value of portability. We were able to take this piece of kit out of the lab and take it to the competitive environment, which for us was a British beach in the UK in our gazebo, and it held up well. I'm going to look at Matt, see if I've forgotten anything. Do you want to add anything? I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I was expecting a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, really nice work. Um, thanks for that. Um, just <clears throat> with regard to figure that showed the left and the right bars, um, the variability, just based on the size of the error bars, looks slightly more on the left limb yeah. in a lot of the muscles than the right. Is there any kind of comment you want to make from that? Um, in terms of the left limb, the, um, thinking we. I don't, I've, I've actually got the data in front of me in my head in terms of uh, whether or not they're regular or goofy footed, okay, but the uh, their left leg would, I think most of the surfers are actually regular footed, which means their left leg is their forward leg, which is actually doing most of the driving um, in, in surfing. So if you imagine, um, I don't want to give people a surfing lesson, but you know, you're putting all of your weight on that front leg and that's driving your turns, whereas the back leg is more control. Um, so that may explain some of the differences. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, Rick Bain and, and lateral gastro, so kind of tight, you know, tight and tightening it down, what you're saying, yeah. Cool. What's next, following now what you found from this study? If, so was, is this a preliminary for future ideas, or what was, what's um, the overall scope of going in yeah, the so group and getting norm values. Yeah, so potentially um, we'd probably look at analysing the data slightly differently, comparing the dominant and non-dominant sides in addition to considering the stance um, preference. We'd also be really interested in looking at the surfing um, before and after competition. Um, so given the environment and the type of com competition that this was, it would be perfectly feasible to have um, a pre and post competitive um, comparison between the EMG site, TMG sites. Um, so I think that would be one avenue um, for future study, definitely. I think for having been somebody who's been around surfing for many years, one of the things that's always frustrated me, uh, and probably frustrates other sports scientists and other sports, is when uh, people design training programs um, and they, they make assumptions about what muscles are being used and how they're actually being used. Uh, and the same thing is true of surfing, actually. People um, have developed different training programs for surfers, but nobody's actually said, well, actually, these are the muscles that are becoming the most fatigued during exercise, and this is the way that you need to train them. So it's, it's based on, okay, well, they look like they're doing this, so we should train them in this way. And I think it'd be really good um, to get them in a, a rested condition and then fatigue them through surfing, either in a contest or uh, an extensive surfing session. You know, surfers 
Uh, recreationally, we'll normally surf for like two or three hours at a time uh, until you get the, I'll use the scientific term of spaghetti arms, which is where your arms no longer work. And that's usually when surfers get out. So if we, you know, we could probably look at that and look at the TMG and see if something's happening there, but you did. My, my only problem we may, might have, thinking about what you said earlier, is that if they are good surfers, we might not see enough of a change in those in that TMG. Um, so maybe we need to look at kind of uh, intermediate surfers who are maybe going to experience more fatigue and that will help us or exacerbate the kind of fatigue effects. Yeah. Good approach and interest studying and see with surfing being actively in sport and in insight as well. But, um, from reading this information here is actually when you ask about this slide, the tibialis anterior, so on the right tibialis an anterior, um, there's a rapid displacement, so there's a dominance within that muscle group, is that right? Um, so tibialis anterior didn't have a great displacement on the right hand side, that's yeah. this one here, yeah. um, and it took a relatively long time to get to 10% of that height by looking at by comparing to the other joints on the other graph there, the different muscle sites. Um, I think thinking about the size of the muscle and potentially the role that tibialis anterior has on surfing performance might explain that somewhat. Um, in that it may not be a major contributor to surf performance, especially if 30% of the time is spent paddling um, and when they're standing upright on the board it's of the muscle groups there. Um, I was curious as to what, at what stage did you measure them? And it's, it started with me thinking about water temperature. Because as a kid, I grew up surfing in Australia, and now I surf in Ireland. <laughs> it's totally different. Uh, and I'm just thinking, I mean, did you peel the wetsuit off them? Did you do it before they put the wetsuit on? It was be before they put the wetsuit on, so it's before they um, they competed. We're taking some other measures for um, other work as well. Um, and we made sure that they were dry, we made sure that they were warm, um, and that was it, essentially. We hadn't considered water temperature, um, purely because of the fact we were testing them before they'd got into the water. Um, but that's something that we might bear in mind for if we do do future work. A bit of funding to Brazil or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that would be very nice to get yeah. some chocolate. I mean, the, the great thing is, this, um, I suppose we would have an effect if they'd been, been in the water in terms of uh, fatigue. Um, but we, this was take, this, we did this, this experiment in, in May time, um, and the surfers were generally wearing kind of three mil or four mil suits. And actually, uh, they, like I said, they'd be quite happy in, in the sea for um, three or four hours under those conditions, and they're actually surfing 25 minute heats. So the, the temperature wouldn't really be too much of an issue for them, but wouldn't, wouldn't chill them down that much in that short period of time. And um, we can see, um, we've got a, this is a South African surfer actually in the background there. Uh, and she's, in, she's actually being tested um, at that time. Um, so what would happen is they would come, they would arrive in their, their normal clothes and would use a towel or a changing robe or something to give us access uh, to the sites, but still keep them warm. Uh, and actually the Leeds Becky gazebo was a, Fantastic for this. It, it worked really well in terms of getting us out of the wind and uh, allowing us to operate in a, a kind of a relatively warm environment. And good for Mark. Fantastic for Mark. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, not directly related to the study as such, but just a more general question, probably with regard to surfing and, and wearing a wetsuit, and I guess there's a, an element of compression within the suit as well and again I'm just thinking of you know, swimming race suits and then the compression that goes on there and you know sort of, that makes it very difficult to get measurements for one thing but you know do you think uh, that that's something that's maybe worth investigating as well is actually the, the influence of compression around the muscles you know first I suppose they probably don't ever sort of without a wetsuit so it's maybe not a question that's even worth asking but you know, just uh, if there's a difference in maybe the, the level of compression that is provided with different qualities of wetsuit perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the, the wetsuits certainly have an effect and actually we're saying that these are, majority, majority of them were British surfers. Um, I said we got a South African lady uh, being tested there. Um, but even <coughs> most of the British surfers 
uh, they will overwinter in South America, Hawaii, uh, and, and nice warm countries, um, and, and will surf, you know, in, in full shorts and bikinis right. and whatever else for that that, that period. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting point because we do have a, a challenging uh, climate here in the UK for surfing. So the surf, the wetsuits that we use, um, we tend to prioritise warmth over anything else, and actually. Te the, the warmer wetsuits tend to be thicker and less elastic. Um, so actually you, you're restricting movement and you can certainly feel some fatigue around your shoulders if you're wearing a very warm wetsuit because you're actually having to work against the wetsuit uh, when you're actually paddling and those types of things. But I, I, I think there would be some element of compression, but it would be very much dependent on um, the thickness of the wetsuit, the design of the wetsuit um, and the quality of the wetsuit. So, uh, the more expensive wetsuits nowadays uh, tend to be very flexible, very comfortable and very warm, but they don't last very long. Uh, whereas if you go for a wetsuit that is, is very warm and will last you for a long period of time, it's actually usually quite stiff and it's usually a little bit cheaper. It's worth considering. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.